Hello and welcome to another episode of Rock Lives Radio. This is a show where we discuss inspiring personalities and interesting things. I am your host Tanmay Shah, an NFT artist, entrepreneur with diverse business experience. This show is self-sponsored, so if you have been seeing this show and if it's adding value, uh, you can check out and buy my NFTs, and you can also become my patron. If you are new to the channel, please uh, make sure you subscribe and share this episode with your friends, and do check out the earlier episodes. You are most welcome to join our weekly Twitter Spaces that happen on Saturdays every week. Where you will see it's called NFT for all. Here you will see amazing artworks. Many collectors come by. Uh, we discuss NFT insights. We have music, jokes, and much more. It goes on for twelve hours. So no matter your time zone, you can definitely join in whenever you can. So you can directly talk to me. Have any questions? You can discuss there, and see you there then. Okay. Hello, everybody. I uh, wish you a very happy new year. New year. Uh, this is the first episode of uh, 2023, and we are joined in by amazing guest, uh, creator, collector, and curator, Mark Kelly, who also goes by the name of uh, Sauce Book. Is that the right pronunciation? How do you pronounce it? Yes, yeah, Sauce Sauce Book is sauce fine. Book. Okay. Mark Kelly goes by the name Sauce Book. on all nft platforms and twitter and has been a creator and collector of nfts for almost 2 years as a creator he is uh, const- as as a creator he is constrained to ai assisted artworks but his taste as collector are very broad excluding only and uh, not safe for work uh, things pepes <laughs> and eth and bitcoin themed works he has collected over 500 artists including me i should say and a variety of uh, from a variety of platforms and is now focusing on curating a weekly drop on nifty gateway where he aims to highlight some of the favorite artists and he has collected multiple that he has collected multiple times and open the door for them to a larger collector base Mark, welcome to the show. So nice to have you at Rock Class Radio. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, believe it or not, I'd forgotten that I'd collected from you. So uh, who, who knows? Nifty Gateway might beckon yet. <laughs> All right. Um, before the first question, I really love the Buddha Mur- Murti behind you, the statue. Oh, Buddha statue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not sure whether it can be seen yet. Yeah, yeah. My wife's taste in interior deco. Oh, all right. So we all know Mark from his PFP, and he has a collector, curator, and creator. But who is Mark as a person? What is his life story? What did he do before NFTs? Well, I, actually, I'm still doing it. I've been, uh, I've been. I've had a professional life for sort of thirty, forty years going on, mainly in in really boring stuff for the majority of people. It's it's regulation and compliance. I've been a an, a computer auditor um, and a compliance expert. What I do at the moment, I work from home, so it interleaves very nicely with my NFT work. Uh, but I, I advise companies on how to get the regulation right. A very narrow sliver of Regulation in the UK, which is how to report your transactions to the regulator by the close of the next business. So I'm literally spend a half of my day telling people put this value in this field, you know, to represent this trade or or this instrument. So that's uh, that's that's my background. That's what still is putting food on the table and a roof over our heads. NFTs is is kind of an absorbing side hustle still. You know, hopefully. This is the year when it becomes the main hustle, and I can have a long overdue retirement from the uh, from the main work. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my background. It was uh, I studied Spanish uh, literature at university to PhD level, kind of specialised in Saint John of the Cross, and then there was no way, there was no career outcome for that, so I had to switch tracks and become a COBOL programmer with the civil service. 
Um, from programmer, I went to IT auditor to kind of compliance specialist. And that's what, that's what I've been doing for, you know, I've been, as I say, I've been going programmer, auditor, compliance specialist for the last 40 years. Very interesting. You're a veteran. You're, you have seen the web one rising, like you've been and seen all of the versions of web and the uh, yeah. evolution of internet. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And it's just a world of missed opportunities, you know, because I was in position to buy Microsoft when it first came out or, Ooh. you know, buy, buy the first Bitcoin and I just ignored them. But that continues, you know, a, a year and a half ago, I was ignoring Bored Apes just because I, I didn't like the art and I didn't think they would go anywhere. So when, any, when everyone was diving into PFPs, I was still you know, collecting small editions and one of ones. Okay. How did you first get to know about NFTs then? Um, well, I've been interested in crypto f since about 2017. And I spent a stint at Coinbase as UK head of compliance in 2019. Oh. Um, but NFTs really, I think what caught my attention was the big Beeple sale. In 21, you did a 69 million sale. You know, that got a lot of attention, a lot of a lot of uh, headline news. Um, at the time, I was uh, I was thinking because I was mainly a writer. I've run a, you know blogs and medium uh, medium sites for for years and years. So I was thinking mainly that you could NFT literary works. So my first attempts, which are still somewhere on OpenSea, are little haikus and snippets of conversation or poetry minted and 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 put up on open sea that didn't go well i think it's still a little bit early for literary nfts i think they're going to have their day but it probably takes someone like jk rowling or someone really famous to say here's a short story and it's only available via nft that would uh, that would be the the boost that we need anyway i did a few literary nfts a few music nfts because i've got a, a bit of a creative background in music oh. as well. So, you know, uh, like uh, QI70 banjo instrumentals. Again, they're, they're out there somewhere. I haven't burnt them, uh, but it takes some some NFT archaeology to dig them out. None of that worked. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I, I sent a, a video to Nifty Gateway and said, hey, how about having me on your platform? Here's some some haikus I wrote. I'm still waiting for a response from that original application in March 21. But uh, but in the meantime, I got kind of hooked on Nifty Gateway as a platform and started my second phase, which was as a collector. And for six months, I just, you know, I, I mean, I'm not, um, I was, wasn't collecting from wealth. I was collecting from credit. So I was running up the Amex and you know, that all came to a bad end. I had to have a big fire sale in November of 21, got rid of some pieces I really loved um, and have never been able to reacquire. Uh, but, you know, that was that was the end of the first phase. That was me reducing to a minimum collecting. In the meantime, I'd found that there were some tools that opened the door to me for the visual arts. So, and, and because I was a writer by background, what it was was the text to image AI scripts things as simple as Night Cafe or Wombo, where you could just type in uh, type in a, a piece of prose and it comes out with a wonderful picture. That was magic. That was uh, that was like a renaissance for me. It was, like I said, opened the door and I went going whole, you know, since probably for a year and a half now, I've mainly been focused on creation. Just going with, through all the scripts from those early ones to getting more and more uh, complex. I, I bought the hardware to, so that I could ramp up the level of detail, the level of, you know, do the higher resolution things. And we'll talk a bit later probably about what happens in 23. I think in 23, we move from still pictures, because I think AI can now do a very good job of AI photography, AI stills. You can get the detail, the coherence. Uh, it's it's in a great spot. You know, six months ago, it was very difficult to get uh, a realistic and attractive face out of AI scripts. Now they're all over. Everywhere I look, I see 
beautiful cyber girls and and portraits. It really is easy. It's been democratized, which is great. It's good that anyone can sign up to Dali or Mid Journey and produce these beautiful pictures. Um, but that's that causes a problem for people who are trying to make money and be a specialist in AI because you've got to keep pushing the boundaries. You've got to keep going and looking for the next scripts and being more detailed than other people or more, you know, more inventive. I think the big area for development in 23 will be uh, AI video, you know, AI moving images. People are producing things that generate point clouds. So you can use AI to generate a picture, but then it comes out as a 3D asset which you can then manipulate in Blender or Omniverse or one of one of these other tools. And there's lots of exciting stuff. Might as well dive straight into the future of AI because I think we're just at the foothills of where we're going. Because right now you have to type something in or you have an image. Um, sometimes you have to put in a very detailed prompt to get out exactly what you want. Well. If you're using a starting image and you're saying it's got to be in the style of Beeple or, you know, uh, Greg Rutowski or whatever, then you might as well pick up a brush. You, you're really describing exactly what you want the outcome to be. I prefer to, to do a collaboration with AI where you give it some hints and see what it's got. So, you know, I'll say the mysterious creatures of the deep green ocean. And I don't specify in the style of this artist. I don't specify, you know, the uh, the lighting or anything. And I just generate that in batch and see what it comes up with. Some of the stuff it comes up with is is amazing. So you've got text to image, and you've also got image to image. You can base something off a current image, but uh, or you can put in a video and get it to glitch the video and do you know that can generate some good things. But why not, you know, have thought control? Why not? Why not have speech um, sponsored AI? You just say you describe what you want, and it comes up and says, "How about this?" And you say, "Well, no, maybe a more green tones or something like a di proper dialogue and collaboration with the AI script." Oh, jump ten years ahead. Uh, why not? If if these if we're all chipped with Neuralink uh, by then, why not just? think what you want and see it appear uh, on the screen. The other the other area, sculpture hasn't really been affected by AI, but think about putting in a text prompt or speaking a description and you've got uh, you've got a 3D printer hooked up. Why, why not have something generated directly by AI from the prompt that you're describing? So many uh, so many things. But the first thing I want to do and I want to do it in 23 is to ramp up the the video from AI. Uh, the, the bar is very high. The bar, I, I think AI stills are now at a professional standard. I think they're they're very credible and, and they're doing very well. AI video is still very glitchy, very, uh, you, you can see where it's coming from. The bar has been set by all of these video games. You know, you, you look at Call of Duty or something like that, some of the modern video games, you take any five second clip and it's smoother and more detailed than anything you can gener generate from an AI prompt. So that's the, that's the level. It's, you know, it's CGI, it's things like Avatar and it's video games that are, that are setting the bar. I'll only be fully happy minting and selling AI videos when we can reach that sort of standard. Wow, that's a plethora of things and possibilities yeah. in future. That was, the, that was the scattergun approach to the introduction, wasn't it? <laughs> that is amazing. It it gives uh, rise to many rabbit hole questions. So first of all, you mentioned about 3D assets being created by prompting. Are there any yeah. tools right away or are you expecting them to come in this year? Well, I, I, I'm using one. I mean, most of what I use is a great bit of software called Visions of Chaos uh, by Softology who's based in, in Australia. And what, what it's more like a it's more like a platform because what he does is all of the new AI scripts that come out, he'll test whether they can be harnessed and put into Visions of Chaos. So, you know, right now I think D Forum 
this is a spin-off of Stability Diffusion. Stability Deforum is the, the latest and greatest. 0 0.7 just came out a day ago, and uh, he's already in, incorporated it into the latest beta release of Visions of Chaos. So I'm going to, the rest of today, I'm going to go off and try that out because the last couple of videos that I make, which were halfway decent, were through the forum. Um, so have, that's the main thing that I use. Have you got that? I have tried Visions of Chaos, uh, but it only, I, I wasn't able to extract a 3D object file. It only gives out images or videos. Yeah, well, well there's, there's, there's a couple of things you can do. One is the D forum animation. I, I've, I put something up, which is like a spinning cube. And all that does is takes a picture of a 3D, cu a 3D cube and then just uh, does an animation with it shifting one degree to the left or right after every frame. You put those together, you get the impression of a spinning cube. But more, uh, more impressively, they've incorporated the point E, the point cloud generation has just been incorporated in Divisions of Chaos in the latest versions. I don't think the latest public version has got it, but if you subscribe as a patron, you get early access to a lot of these features. So I'm starting to have a look at the point cloud. Point what cloud, does point cloud do? Point, point cloud can take a, a just a still picture of a chair or a dog or something, and it looks at it and it analyzes the depth map, and then it puts together literally a cloud of points which all stay in the same relation to each other. And the denser they are, the more you smoothly rendered the picture looks. And it generates a ply or an XYZ object, which you can then pull, put into Blender and turn it around and look at it from all angles. So you, your AI can generate a monster and then the, the point, point E facility can spin it around and, uh, and you can start to use it for 3D. Uh, as a 3D asset. I love the fractals that come out in Visions of Chaos. I'm, I've been trying to get that in Blender, but I think I'll have to just import a file or export it using Point Cloud and then get it inside Blender. Yeah, are you, are you talking about the artifacts, the extra little bits that you don't, uh, uh, that you don't expect? Yeah. I, I love that as well. I mean, some of, especially some of the scripts like Rue Dali, the, the Russian version of Dali, uh, which was done by Spurbank developers, I, I comes out with some amazing stuff that you never expected. You know, this, um, all the creatures of the deep green ocean, it comes up with little people and mermaids and, you know, sea monsters and all, all kinds of stuff. You really, it, it really is there more of a collaboration between what you suggest and what it comes back with. Um, I love 3D and 3D animation. I love the Blender stuff that people are coming out with, and I'm trying to make strides with Omniverse. But all of that is very intentional. You have to really describe exactly what you want. There's no there's no play back and forth. There's no, I suggest this, this is what I get. I tweak the parameter. You know, there's a real game going on between the artist and the AI script um, on, on some of these uh, Visions of Chaos facilities. Right. By fractals, what I meant was, there's another word for it is Mandelbulbs. So, oh yeah. Does, yeah, yeah. So, oh, you use that in Visions of Chaos. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <sighs> look, look, there are there are hundreds because all because it's a grab bag of all of the latest techniques. Some of the first things in Visions of Chaos were were these Mandelbrot sets and and a lot of uh, GPT. Uh, it was a GPT. A lot of the um, a, a lot of the traditional generative um, pictures, the, really they are more mathematical than artificial intelligence. So there are separate sections for these mathematical models and the uh, machine learning. Um, and, you know, life's too short. I haven't been able to explore all of them. We need to use AI and get a grasp. Maybe to explore mm. all these things, we can use an AI to grasp and understand. Well, you know, you know what people are doing now is uh, is they're going to chat GPT. Yeah, I, that is, was my next question. Yeah, chat. You know, people are going to chat GPT and saying, "Give me, give me a great mid-journey prompt to generate, you know, a picture of an old man walking through a field," and it'll come up with something 
and they plug it into mid journey and get out something great. So, you know, you're going to have end to end AI. Now, all we need is to give the AI a MetaMask account and it can mint things and sell them and, and make money. You know, you could have end to end AI, cut out the middleman completely. Probably, as you mentioned, the chip, Neuralink chip. Many times we, we are not able to express our feelings. So you just feel it and you tell, I got this feeling and I have this memory. Make something out of it and show me. Of course, of course, of course. And you could, you could, if you're in a depressed mood, you'll see all these, all, all these, all these d depressing, miserable or, or, or downbeat pictures coming up and probably generate a, a sad piano soundtrack to go underneath it. It's, it's exciting. I'm just, I'm a bit of a tech geek. Um, so I like some of this stuff just because it's cool from a technology perspective, irrespective of whether you could ever do a, a, you know, mint an NFT and make any money out of it. What you might be surprised at is the vast majority of people who are pushing the boundaries of AI art artistry aren't interested in the NFT world. They are just after the, the, the just geeks who are interested in pushing the boundaries, making cool stuff and displaying it, showing the output to their uh, their brethren on the discords. This, the guy, Jason, who generated visions of chaos, he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of what you can do with AI. He's tried NFTs and just he's just put them behind him. You know, I, I gave him the chance to be on Nifty Gateway and he said, no, nah, I'm done with NFTs. So, you know, it, it's a shame, but you've got to, got to respect it. My favorite artist in real life is Simon Stallenhag. He's never going to do an NFT. His work is super suited for NFT promotion, but someone spoiled it by uh, cannibalizing one of his pictures and putting it on a marble card. So he just said, no, Ne never going to happen. Never going to do an NFT. Real shame, because I think it's just—I think it's just another distribution channel. You know, I think art artists can have, you know, their YouTube channel. They can have their real life galleries, and they can have a an NFT collection. Why not? Absolutely. And what what did Jason think about it? Why didn't he appreciate it? Because because being a coder and being into technology himself, he might have um understood the importance or the possibilities with nfts i think he understands it but the, there's a, there's a bit of the nft uh sort of space that not everyone likes which is the marketing aspect you know sitting on twitter all day and engaging with people and answering questions and doing all of this just to get a, a following you know seventeen thousand people follow me on twitter yeah, if I put a if I put a post about something that I'm dropping, a bit of art, I might get four or five sales. The, you know, there's a big. You've got to think of Twitter as a chat room more than a shop front. I like the chat room. I like the back and forth and just the dialogue, but I don't expect that to be where I make money. Um, you know, maybe maybe just getting the right platform might be that it's now Nifty Gateway is the place. The there's, there's been a real shift uh, in the in the market between, you know, there was uh, it was all one of one and short, small editions a year and a half ago. Then we had the phase when PFPs were everything, you know, and the way to make money was to have a big 10K project that just sold out and went went mental on secondary. Then there was that's kind of faded. And there was a, a real push for one of one art. I think the one of the one of one art is. It's kind of failing. It's it's still quite strong on super rare uh, for the big wallets on foundation, but I only see a couple of dozen collectors supporting that market. There are, there are a couple of dozen big collectors. Yeah, I could name a dozen of them sort of straight away. Outside of that, if you don't get their attention, then then you you know you might be waiting six months for a, a sale at point one of an ether. Even if you do get their attention, how many of your works are they going to buy before they move on? They might buy a couple. They really like your stuff, but there are other people out there. There's new work appearing daily. So I, I find that myself as a collector, I'd buy a couple of pieces from someone. And unless they were really my absolute favorites, I would move on and find someone else. Always looking for new talent out there. 
you know, there were three or four I'd go back to again and again. You know, Collins Doodle, Stripes Art, Ninja. You know, you look at my, uh, some of my uh, Nifty Gateway drops, the people who are appearing over and over again. Um, I've got a big OG drop, which is people I used to collect on Nifty Gateway like a year and a half ago. I'm bringing three of them back for this Sunday. The week after that, I'm going to do Sourcebook Superstars. That is the people that I introduced to Nifty Gateway in between September, September and December of 22, who had the biggest impact, who really uh, found their niche and got a lot of new followers. So there's four or five of them um, who are my, my stars from season one, bringing them back. They're the new guard. The old guard is this Sunday. The new guard is the following Sunday. So um, let's just let's just talk more about Nifty Gateway and uh, Source Book Sunday that you are hosting. So first of all, what attracted you to do this on Nifty Gateway as a platform, and what is exactly that you are going to be putting out, or what well, should I, people look out for in this? It, it was it was really a, a return to Nifty Gateway. You know, I I, I applied to be a, an artist on there, didn't get anywhere. I collected and overextended myself and I had to cut everything down. But I've always kept a foot in the camp. I've always kept an eye on what they're doing. And um, I just, uh, you know, they've had a couple of competitions. I was very keen to in, get involved in a secondary slam and uh, and another competition uh, a year later. Um, so I've always kept kept abreast of what Nifty Gateway was doing. So in August, they sent out a thing saying, look, we're gonna make a new, we're gonna bring in a new structure. We're gonna open the doors so that people can build a business or on the Nifty Gateway platform. We're going to allow people to apply to be publishers. So just as Nifty Gateway curates and publishes some of the best art out there, they were opening the door for mini publishers to come in, have a storefront, just like an Amazon or eBay storefront, and actually represent themselves or their, their stable of artists. Now, I love the, the idea of this, because first of all, at some stage, I was sure I could slip in some of my own art. And secondly, I've collected over 500 artists. There's at least 200 artists that I've gone back and collected multiple times because I, I'm so keen on them. So I thought, this is great. This is giving all my friends because, you know, funds run out as a collector, unless you're exceptionally wealthy, funds run out and there's a limit to, to the support that you can give to your artists. This was a way I could support my favorite artists, you know, at no cost to myself, give them a new collector base, give them exposure to a new set of people. It was it was a no brainer. So I applied, didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. At first, the people that they were giving the publisher role to were already highly successful artists or publishers or galleries. And the interesting thing was a lot of those were too busy. They have opportunities dropping in their mailbox on a daily basis and they can't, you know, some of them are money makers and some of them aren't. Some of them involve a lot of work. Some of those people are still out there. They've never done a drop, even though they are big names in the Twitter space, the big collectors, whatever. Um, but they weren't getting the traction because they weren't getting involved and putting the work in to do the drop. So after a couple of weeks, Rob from Nifty Gateway got in touch and said, hey, I see your name in the, are you still interested? I said, hell yeah, I, I, I was dying for the opportunity. So I jumped straight in. I thought, I need, you know, you can't do a daily drop. You can't wear out your welcome. I thought the most I could do was a, a weekly drop. And I thought consistency uh, of branding and consistency of turning up at the same time every week is what will build a following. So almost straight away, in September, September the 18th, I went live with the first Sourcebook Sundays. It was a, it was a kind of a prelude. I was, I was putting things out there as tokens so that people would get collective benefits later on. And I chose three great people, Stripes Arts, who does lots of kind of cool uh, skulls and um, like white marble statues of skeletons. Ninja, who does a lot of dark art with, you know, Ash, ash colored statues and fire breaking out of chests and kicks who's one of my favorite 3d animators 
Um, and they were in the prelude drop. It went great. It sold like $8,000 by volume. And lots of people jumped in. They, they, they sold sort of 50, 60 pieces each at, at sort of $50 a pop. And that was it. That was, uh, the, there was a collector's edition in the following week and the week after that. Um, and we were off and running. I think I did, I did the prelude drop. I did Iranian female artists, which we'd arranged before that became a real hot topic. But that caught a moment as well. And that was all in support of some of these Iranian female artists who were really having a tough time. Um, and then we got going with 3D animation and dark arts week and lots of other things. I've had a different theme every week, um, which seems to work because out of those 200 artists that I want to feature, you can say, OK, well, here are the abstract artists and here are the traditional painters and here are the 3D animators. So you, you do themed groups and, and that's been the way we've we've been rolling. Highly successful. We've done $110,000 in volume in three months from September. Um, wow. up, to, up until now, it's been kind of loss making, apart from when I drop my own work, just because Nifty Gateway takes 10%. I've been paying out 80% to, to artists of the total volume. But then there's costs like minting, converting things from Gemini dollars to Ether to send out to the artists, etc. Um, basically, my 10% has been eaten up by costs. So I'll change the cost basis. I'll be a little less generous going forward because uh, I want it to be sustainable. I want to, you know, I don't want it to be a drain on my resources. I want to, I, I want to supply the time and the energy to make it a success and basically have something. Uh, I'll do occasional midweek drops, but basically I want to nail on Source Week Sundays, 5 p.m. Eastern time every week for the rest of the year. And wow. I've got, I've got, uh, I've got ample, I haven't really even looked, I haven't even gone through methodically and grouped all of my things by theme. I've already got themes to last me through to the end of February and agreement from most of the artists to take part. Here, here's something that I, I do, just one that I'm really excited about that's coming up uh, in a few weeks' time. There are lots of collectors like me who are all, also creators. What do they get in their in their DMs? They don't get questions about their art and their process. They get, can you support this? Can you retweet this? You probably see it a lot as well. Can you buy this? People r relate to these collectors just as collectors, as bottomless wallets. And I wanted to show um, that, that uh, these collectors have this big creative impulse as well and some real credentials on the creative side. So I'm putting together Collect the Collectors um, as a theme. Wow. I won't tell you now who they are, but some of the biggest names, some of the people, people, uh, a lot of folks don't even realize that they are creators. They just think of them as collectors. So that's going to be a real, real exciting one a, a few few weeks down the line. Absolutely. Having interest in collecting means they have a little bit of sense. I mean, for somebody to be collecting, they need to have a bit inside them, right? So in other yeah. words, if you if you have never tasted sugar, you won't know how it tastes like. So you have to have a bit of taste to have get more. So no, look, it, it, all, all... it all helps. It all helps. You know, being having been a creator and try to interest people in my work, and having been a collector and try to find the best work, both of those sides really help on the curation because I'm trying to I'm trying to keep the collectors happy with benefits and utility and you know just giving them great new art that they other, otherwise wouldn't see. And I'm trying to keep the artists happy. I'm constantly monitoring the results, adjusting the prices and the structure, just to get the best payout to the artists. And you know, at one time. When the publisher mechanism was new, there was a race to the bottom and I was leading the charge, you know, because lots of publishers were coming in and the only race way to the bottom as in the race to the bottom on pricing. So, you know, the first couple of things I put up were $50, $150, $75. Very soon they weren't selling because new publishers were coming in and doing $20, $10, $1. Mm. So I had a couple of months of saying, look, it's not going to go at 50 or $75. We've got to do 20. We've got to do 10. I mean, my best, 
my most successful personal creation ever was a little set of monkeys. It was a source book token, little brass monkeys. People thought it was a photo, but it was actually produced by AI. I priced it at $10 and it sold 410. So there's 4,100. That's what, that's three ether or more. There's nothing I've ever sold as a one of one or edition, which is sold three ether of, uh, so, you know, people are, are, are a bit blinkered in thinking, I've got to preserve my value. I've got to get value from my work. I've got to stay with one of one. Actually, the uh, momentum has shifted towards editions. And sometimes you can get a very good return for small editions. Kix, the 3D animator, I was one of the first people to say, here's a $1 piece. It was almost going to be a giveaway. But then I said, well, let's put it up at $1. It sold 3,600. So all of a sudden, you know, he's, I mean, the economics on the $1 things aren't, aren't very good because you take off 30 cents for credit card payment, 10% 10, 10 for nifty, you end up with 50 or 60 cents, but it's still good. 3,600, even half of that is better than a lot of people are getting for one of ones. He sold 3,600. And then a secondary market kicked in where Heaven's Floor started trading a lot on secondary. So that's that's probably done more secondary volume than anything else. It's done like $2,000 on secondary, which means another $200 commission goes off to the artist. Um, so I'm always keeping an eye, an eye on the pricing. What's happened now is all of the publishers are doing $1 drops. So now people are being selective, even on the $1 pieces. So now I'm, I'm thinking, okay, now you have to distinguish yourself. You have to do quality art, fewer and better drops at a higher price. So the theme for me for Sourcebook Sundays, which is by now an established brand, it's going to be you know, medium size prices. It's going to be $49 to $69 range, maybe dropping down to 10 or 20 for collector's drops. But I've taken collector's drops out of the Sourcebook Sundays. And the reason for that is if you have a couple of things at 25 and then you've got a collector's benefit at $10 or $5, that's what gets all the attention. So for the, the sake of audience, let me just recap once again. Yeah. What, you're a curator at Nifty Gateway. Yeah. Where you uh, curate artists and collectors. You bring them, you have a basket of NFT creators and then you promote them through the platform for yes. which uh, the platform keeps 10% uh, curator. You as a publisher gets 10% and uh, the other artists get the other, uh, their, their benefit in that. And who, who has the responsibility of doing the marketing in it? Is it the publisher um, or it, well, is it? I think the things that are most successful are where the, where the artists step up and do a lot of the marketing, but well, actually that, that, that's not true. That helps. I do marketing the, my next drop, is all is always going to be my pinned tweet. So 17,000 people potentially are seeing that every week. The artists expand it to their circle and get their friends involved. The best thing of all is if Nifty Gateway gets involved. If Nifty Gateway really like a drop, they can promote it. They can include it in the email that goes out to all of the collectors every day. They can, um, they can feature it on their homepage and What's happening with this next one, this OG drop, where I'm bringing back Alex Manrique and Jonathan Foster and Vincent Eubags. These were people I was collecting back in early 21. They're coming back for the first time for ages onto Nifty Gateway. So the, the top brass, the owners of Nifty Gateway, really excited about this. They're retweeting the pin. They're, uh, they're telling people about it. And they've given me the chance to host a, a spaces from the Nifty Gateway Twitter account on just a couple of hours before the drop starts. So that's the, that's the sort of thing that really puts a rocket under a, 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 under a thing. But it's still, it's part of the same theme. I'm representing artists that I've bought multiple times. Now, all of these artists, these OG artists are people that I've collected from. Jonathan Foster, one of my favorite artists ever. And yeah, you know, I've got stuff from him that's from way back when on the Tez platform. I've been a collector of his from when he first dropped on Nifty Gateway. Delighted to have him come back. But 
Alex Manrique and Vincent Eubanks, I was collecting them. I had to let go of some real great works of theirs when I had that big fire sale, November 21. Um, but, you know, I'm delighted to bring them back. And although I'm a publisher, I had to set up a separate account just so I can support my artists and buy them because I can't buy them from the main account because I minted them. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't actually do that. So I set up a, a backup account. I'm buying. I'll be at the front of the queue when these guys drop on Sunday. I'll want to be grab a place in the auction. I'll, I'll want to grab some open editions. Um, I'm very excited to bring them back. You're going to have to talk for a while while I, um, I, I drink and get the frog, frog from, from my throat. Yes, yes, absolutely. So we have been, we have been uh, seeing Mark Kelly and his PFP since many, many months and ages. He's always giving amazing insights on spaces, um, encouraging artists, giving alpha, just like as you heard right now. So, yeah, it's so nice to have you. And uh, <laughs> that also brings me to a commercial break. If you want a couple of few seconds more, I would well, that's say. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll go for your commercial, and then I'll tell you where my PFP comes from. Yeah, that was a, that was a question I had. So, everybody, you're listening to Rock Lads Radio. Uh, we have been doing this show. We are, we are in the second year now. We have had over 40 artists, um, experts from diverse fields, not just NFT artists and creators, but we have had um, we have we have had military veterans, doctors um fashion models many many things you can see now you can also see the videos on youtube and for the older episodes you can see on spotify uh, uh, apple uh, podcast and wherever you get your podcast from i myself am a pod um, artist nft artist and if you want to support the show you can check out my nfts also become a patron and if you want to if you want to add do advertisement on the podcast we we welcome that too. So I hope you are enjoying the show. And I'll be putting out shorter clips of this on YouTube. So stay in, stay in touch for that. Okay, Mark. So you're talking about your PFP. What uh, what you have never changed it. What no, no. what is the story behind the PFP? I, I, I never will. You know, I, I, even if I ever uh, acquire a board ape, it's not going to be my PFP. My PFP is part of my part of the part of the branding, part of my character. I think I'm becoming more like my PFP over time. Um, but it's a picture of Damon Runyon, and uh, as, as a teenager, I was I loved his stories because they're all very short, and I had a short attention span, very short, very pithy, and they're all told in the first person. It's someone who's standing on the fringe of mobsters and gangsters in 1920s New York and just talking, you know, the, just the stories. They're very, very funny. He's got a great humor, humorous style. And I, I sort of, I've always liked him. I brought him back as a character in a novel that I wrote called The Alpha Lab in sort of 2003. And, um, and he was like, he was like a mental guy. You know how uh, in meditation sometimes you, you have these alpha guides, you have the, the spirit guides, a male and a female. Well, my character's spirit guides were Damon Runyon and Mae West, both from 1920s New York. And I've got a very special affinity with, with, the, with the two of them as artists. Um, so Damon Runyon came back as, as the, the PFP for Sourcebook um, because I've written about him on Medium, I've included him in a novel. He's my, he's sort of my writing guru. His writing style is something I really like. So as a, a sort of essentially a writer who's dabbling in visual arts, um, you know, D Damon seemed like the right PFP. And it's, it's distinctive. You don't, nobody, uh, you know, nobody else has got a, a PFP quite like that. I don't see that I'm ever going to change it. In fact, at one stage on my Twitter account, I said, if you ever don't see Damon Runyon as my PFP, then you know I've been hacked. hacked. I, actually, that's, that's not a, that, that has turned out true because my, I had two hacks in, in 22, one in January, one in December. And my found it, if you go to my foundation account, um, or my OpenSea account attached to my old wallet, 
Sure enough, the PFP has changed. No more Damon Runyon. It's uh, someone called Pennywise, who now looks like a big collector, but uh, actually, you know, it's all the stuff that I bought. I've, I'm going through a, a messy divorce with the Ethereum chain. So, <sighs> uh, uh, and the reason for that is, you know, I've been reasonably careful, but I got hacked twice in uh, in in one year. So why would I? I've got two separate sets because they're still from the old hack. I've still got stuff I never rescued from the the new hack. There's like a couple of hundred things I collected I never rescued. Twenty two ethers worth of inventory oh stuck God. and at at risk, vulnerable. Why would I? I've set up a new wallet. Why would I? Go, go and build up another store of inventory if I'm not sure that the chain is secure or that I can operate it securely. Meanwhile, on Nifty Gateway, I've got 500 things which are just, just fine, totally unaffected. Why is that? Because they do custodied wallets for all of your NFTs and they've got two-factor authentication when you try to, to sign in. And I've put two-factor authentication over any attempts to transfer things out or list them or, or do anything. Um, it's it's as secure as I can be in the NFT space just now. So that's just another good reason for focusing on Nifty Gateway. And, you know, people have a hard time now if they turn up in my DMs saying, by this, it's only 0.1 <laughs> of an ether. I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm still it's spending... I'm still spending Ether to try to rescue my old stuff. Why would I go and buy some more and add to the problem? So what do you think about Tezos? I love it. Tezos love it. or Solana? Yeah, no, Solana, not so much. Um, but Tez, I'm a big fan. I've got a, quite a large collection on Tez. Now, I stopped selling things on Tez because I didn't think the cost benefit was there. You know, the work I put into pre preparing a thing and, you know, I was struggling to sell them at one or two tears, but I'll buy at that level till the cows come home. And I have, you know, I've got stuff going back over a year, um, you know, nearly two years on, on the test platform, some beautiful stuff. And I've never sold, I've never made a secondary sale on Tezos, I don't think. Um, that's my pure art collection where I can pick up something that's quirky and just forget about it. Just leave it in the, uh, leave it in the vault for, you know, happier days for the, the next bull cycle. So two factor authentication was a great tip for every transaction. So can it be done on MetaMask and all other wallets that people are using? Um, not, uh, seemingly not. I mean, some of the centralized platforms could easily bring in 2FA, you know, Foundation and OpenSea, they could say, okay, you want to change the the website uh, branding. You want to change the PFP. Well, we can see that you've got the keys, but um, give us the so 2FA. Yeah. Give, us the, give us the 2FA and we'll know that you own this account. That simple thing would have saved me so much, so much problem. And they so could have. That's asked, only possible with the platform. That's not possible no. within the wallet right now. Within MetaMask, it's just a bare bones thing. You got the keys, the wallet's yours. It's not really yours. You enter into this weird dual ownership thing. And I've got this dual ownership thing at the moment. Now, unfortunately, I can't put in gas to transfer things out to the secure wallet because there's an auto withdraw function on from time to time. I'm in communication with a hacker from time to time. I get a window where I can transfer things out. It's a very slow process. No, oh, no. So talking about security and NFTs, what are your key suggestions for the listeners? Well, you know, a custodied wallet is good. I'm, I'm not going to keep banging on about Nifty Gateway, but I, you know, I've had things that I bought there a year or more ago, which are completely secure because they've just been sitting in a custody wallet with two factor authentication. The other thing is probably get a ledger, keep it off offline. Now, to me, it's a little bit depressing that in Web3 and this brave new world, 
the only way we can secure our our internet uh, assets is by taking them offline and having them in, in a little you know it's like having stuff in a little mm-hmm. in a little drawer but that's what I'll do I've ordered a stacks are they the little the little ledger wallets where you key in your password and get it wrong three or four times they they didn't never worked for me I was more at risk of forgetting the the access password than I was of someone hacking me or so I thought but the stacks with a screen it's got more usability it it looks good but they won't start shipping till march so i'll be doing very little on the ether chain except paying artists and you know maybe rescuing a few old nfts i'll be very, doing very little on eth chain before your previous, march your previous hack, hacks happened due to phishing attacks or because you plugged no. into some um... no all, all of my I, i mean i'm very open I, i've kept my dms open for anyone i follow um i'm very open on on discord as well i'll chat with anyone i love the dms i spend more time in dms than on the public feed so i'm very reluctant i've made some great friendships i've had some great opportunities like mirage gallery art to act mint marketplace all of those have come in via dms so i'm very reluctant to shut that down but i've been a little too open and too trusting i've given people the benefit of the doubt the first hack was um was some kind of commission or collaboration they said look we'll send you things that an idea of what we wanted to look like um and they sent me something and i clicked it and it was a dot scr a screen saver um thing now screen saver turns out to be a format like exe that can disguise a virus so that was a that was a proper hack it was a proper wallet hack they stole my keys sent them off i think to an ip address in the seychelles and um and that was it they changed they started selling my stuff listing and selling and i, I never really had any communication with those hackers they just took what they wanted so this time um, you were using hot wallet this was this was the time you were this is a hot wallet i i i clicked on the clicked on the screen saver um thing while my metamask account was unlocked and open so they you know i made it easy for them i could have opened it on a separate platform on a separate desktop but no i opened it in the browser where the metamask was open so they took the keys and ran so you um, you didn't you didn't even have to do sign press sign on the metamask you just Your Met- no, Metamask no, no. wallet was open, and this website no. was open. So it you is, just opened the website, and it went. It didn't even ask you to sign something. Yeah, exactly. Is that what you're saying? It didn't ask me to sign something. It was just double clicking on this thing, which had a macro inside. It was now on my machine. I double clicked to say, "Do what you would like," and it went off and it took the keys out. Now I'm not very technical, but I don't think I I signed anything. First thing I knew about the hack was. you know waking up and my open sea account was selling things for next to nothing um because they'd put them up for sale and they transferred all of the ether out i didn't keep a lot of ether in metamask um but the nfts were compromised hmm. ne- i never got most of those back so not double clicking anymore been very careful about downloading you know downloading encrypted uh archives and things i found out the other day how the second hack happened and it wasn't a really a sophisticated metamask wallet hack it was bad security that i had over my email and this is what this is a, a real cautionary tale i was so keen on not losing access to my new wallet after the first wallet hack that i put all of my keys in an email and sent oh. it from put it from one email account to another now aol mail is was compromised uh, and probably it's just on a list in the dark web of here's a load of you know AOL mail accounts and their passwords because I hadn't changed the password for years so the second hack was like a result of the first because I was stupid about sending the the keys to myself someone just went through the mails and find found the um found the keys so they were created. keeping a watch on you and they had your mail id and password 
yeah and yeah, then yeah they track the yeah so they must be they must be keeping an eye on you since a long time then how did how does well, somebody you, you don't know that because i i haven't changed my AOL my password for ages of course i have now ah. um so they could pick up a list of compromised accounts from the dark web troll through you know go through them and just do some data scanning and maybe they were looking for you know anything that had 12 separate phrases mm. um yeah you, you could probably build something that would scrape through all of it and find something that looked like metamask keys anyway that was the uh, that was my gross error after the first attack that enabled the attack on the second wallet now who knows there may be some third attack vector that i know i know nothing about for the moment it's better for me to kind of keep a low profile on the ethereum chain what i'm been considering now is just keep one burner account like i already have that and the main creator account because as a creator you're a creator collector and curator all of them so as a creator our wallets are identity now your name is associated with all the platform everywhere you go there is this string of numbers which tells okay this is this person so more yeah. than even more than the ethereum money or the nfts it's the about the identity identity yeah, which is more valuable the, so the inconvenience cost is huge because now all of a sudden i've got accounts linked to the hacked wallet on known origin voice foundation open sea mint marketplace all over the place and they've all been rebranded to this new uh, this other guys pfp he's built a whole the whole web of of oh, interconnected no. pl- uh, platforms which was funded by me and which i now can't uh, i can't access it's it's strange so what I, what what i what i've been deciding is it's okay if some money goes for gas but there's just one account where that ac- i'll always be transferring it to that burner account and only purchasing from that burner account and yeah. then transferring it back to a vault or wherever i want it to be saved So, yeah yeah i'm yeah, only people, using the identity account for minting on official well known platforms nothing else nothing apart from that i th- i think i understand now why a lot of big collectors have a vault you know they they've got their active their day to day account but then when they get something they're going to want to keep for the long term they transfer it into their vault and the keys to that are probably locked up they probably never access it to send things out it's a it's like one way traffic they they put stuff into secure storage great it's idea it's like a black hole <laughs> yeah it's a great idea except you know except it's not uh, it's not generally accessible and viewable by by the public mm-hmm. i'm talking about you as a creator how you you mentioned that there are only a couple of dozens of collectors which are still there in the nft space and getting their attention is important or it's tough so how what are the tips would you get on uh, getting attention of collectors um i've done a, you know i've done an article on on engagement the first thing is just keep developing keep improving your art because i get a lot of questions from people saying look I've had this stuff up for months. I've I've not you know it hasn't sold. What am I doing wrong? Well, a if I'm honest, it's not that great. You need to develop your art skills more. B you're repeating, you're showing the same thing over and over again in the Twitter feeds. You're spamming it. You're putting it in all the art threads. You're attaching it as a response. to a discussion thread there's all kinds of things that people are doing wrong on twitter that's just going to get them blocked or at best skipped over and overlooked so you got to you got to be continually improving i try not to put the same piece of artwork up twice because you know people have seen it you got to uh, you got to assume people have seen it and move on and show show something different show show fresh work show that you're you're developing and that your skills are improving you know i i, I wouldn't uh, i wouldn't have sold anything if i was still trying to sell the first things that i created out of night cafe a year and a half ago you know i wouldn't have moved forward at all so constantly trying to improve that's the first thing 
then the engagement has to be subtle. You can't take a sledgehammer approach to engagement on Twitter. You can't really. I mean, I'm I'm a soft touch. I'm going to be less of a soft touch going forward. But you can't just turn up in in people's direct messages and say, "Hi, hey, I'm a, I'm so and so. You're going to love my work. Go off and buy it." You know that 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 kind of thing is just going to get you blocked. So you've got to be be a little so you've got to re recognize the Twitter is a chat room and a community. You can the the best engagement I've got, the most profile visits, the most likes, etc., has been from and the most follows has been not from showing links, not from showing art. It's been from reading people's posts and making some relevant and intelligent comment on the post, moving the discussion forward. Because people like to have a conversation. They like to think, oh yeah, he gets me. You know, he's he's sort of engaging intellectually and, and saying something back. That's what I like on my threads as well. I put things out there which are conversation starters. It's not a fully formed final final word on anything. I'm not interested in, in drama. If someone comes back and says, I think that's completely wrong because I think one of one is still the place to be. Then I'll engage with that and I'll say, yeah, but, you know, six months ago, I was getting 0.4 of an ether for my one of ones. I had to come down to 0 0.05 before the last few sold. What's going on in the one of one space? So you, you get a dialogue going and you know, people get interested in, in what you're saying and follow the links. They go back to your bio. They might read your pinned tweet, give you a follow, give you a, a retweet. I find that, um, to be honest, Twitter works better with words than it does with pictures. Mm. You mentioned about improving your art and yep. in, in the long way, in the long term, building your own legacy as an artist. I think that's what we all should be working towards. Many of the artists as it's blockchain and you can not just delete stuff out of the internet. It always stays there. People are in two minds. Should I wait to mint more artworks till the old ones are sold or should I just wait till, uh, or should I just mint it anyways? And if you say the, I should sell out the old artworks, uh, only in the first place, then should I reduce the price or keep the same price? Does the pricing affect my future uh, pr prospects of sales? What are, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Um, I think people have got some, I think artists sometimes misunderstand collector's mentality. You know, if I bought some someone, and I have bought some people at 0.5 of an ether, it's because I really, really like the artwork. And there are some people I've done that for, like Collins Doodles, um, Polly Columa, who does the little chameleon animations, Stripes Art and Ninja. I've bought all of those one of ones for like half of an ether. Now, what the artist might think is, oh, my floor is half an ether. I can't go below that. Not at all. From a collector's perspective, I love the fact that I can go onto Nifty Gateway or sometimes to Known Origin Editions and pick up great art from these same artists that I love um, in, you know, for 0 0.05 or for $50 or $100. That's, that's great because I like the artist. I like all of their art. I want as much of it as I can get. Um, so, I mean, I'm not too worried about scarcity. The reason I'm not worried about scarcity is I'm not looking at this art to make a quick profit. I'm not looking to flip it in a few weeks time. I want this to, you know, I've got stuff from Stripes Art that I bought in 2021 for 0 0.07. I've managed to transfer it, you know, from the first act wallet to the second wallet and then from the second act wallet. To, you know, I'm going to keep those things forever. These are white marble statue pictures of angels. Um, so, so I don't, you know, I love the, love the guy, I love the art and I'm going to carry on buying. If you put put out stuff at a dollar, I'd be buying. I'd be buying a, a bunch of those. Um, so, so you raise an interesting question, though. How frequently should you mint? You can wear out your welcome if you're dropping something every day. The market is awash with your your works. People can think, oh yeah, okay. One, one of my favorite artists did this recently, 
And I had a word and said, look, you might be diluting your impact on the market because uh, because of the amount of, of things you put putting out there. So, you know, there are extremes. There are people who manage it extremely well, like Chris uh, is, is someone who really did, did well. He, he sort of put out limited editions, he set up a discord, he gave people collective benefits, and then he would give them advance notice and a chance to bid for his new work. You know, he, he really managed it so that he had a, an organic growth which maintained his value. Um, uh, other people, the the, the 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 problem here is people also don't necessarily see their art the way a collector would see their art. So if it's great, this kind of gradual uh, letting it out and maintaining value works, like drip feeding it maintains your value, maintains your floor price. If it's not great, um, you can put out a limited amount of stuff. It might sit there forever, might never sell. If, for those people who are just aren't selling and don't have that demand, what's the harm in them putting out something different, you know, jiggling it up, you know, improving their art or changing their, their theme or style and putting out some other stuff until you find something that works and then focus in on that. Now, that's a very commercial approach. You put out, you know, you do a scattergun, you say, oh, I mean, I was dead set on 3D animations with music background. I thought that was the way to go. But then I found that the ultra detailed 2D stills were selling a lot better than the animations. So, you know, it was a commercial decision, really. I, I said, OK, for the time being, I'm going to get better hardware. I'm going to do more detail, but I'm going to focus on these big 2D stills. Mm -hmm. So it depends. You, you know, if it's great art, it almost doesn't matter what your marketing plan is. If 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 it's if it's amazing stuff, I mean, there there are some people like uh, I don't know DK Motion. It doesn't matter whether he does editions, one of ones. He's going to have a a, a market, whatever happens. Um, there is that level. There, there are other people, frankly, where marketing isn't going to make any difference. It still looks like a high school art club. It's, you know, daubed paint. It's trying to be figurative, but it's not really, it's neither detailed nor beautiful. Uh, you know, there's no accounting for taste. There'll be someone who likes it, but the bulk of people are looking for beautiful, detailed um, art. I mean, my, I've got three things I look for as a collector. Immediate visual impact. It's kind of fairly easy to do, the, to do that with in a variety of ways. Immediate visual impact um, and evidence of both skills and effort. So I want to see the time invested. I love my blue biro artist, Blue Pen Stories. He sends me work in progress almost daily. You know, it's it's a laborious process. He's using biros one, one strike at a time and it builds up over the course of two weeks into something amazing. I love to see that there's skills, there's time invested, and there's great visual impact at the end. So I'm not, although I can only produce AI artworks, my collecting is much more, as you said at the beginning, much more broad. I love traditional art. I love 3D animations. I love cyber, cyberspace and cyberpunks and sci-fi art. Beautiful. So the works that are that haven't sold out, the stock has piled up. Do you would you suggest artists to wait and uh, just let it go at initial price that you have decided, or drop the rates down and try to get uh, over it? Well, there, there there are a couple of approaches. What I've done sometimes is on foundation. You know, a collection doesn't sell out. I'll just open another collection. And I'll, I'll focus all the marketing on the new collection. Maybe that'll get popular. If that gets popular, people might go and start looking at other stuff. You never give up on an artwork that you still like. Obviously, if you moved on and you say, that's rubbish, yeah, burn it. But if, if you still like the artwork, much better than burning is giving it away. Give it away to some of the people who have collected your art. Give them a bonus. Say, look, you've collected two of my artworks over here. I'm going to give you this thing from known origin. And very few of them send it back. Most of them are very grateful to get a little unannounced benefit and bonus. 
I'd much rather see work that I still like, I would never burn. I would much rather give it away to the collectors, the people who have supported me. Beautiful. That's Those are very interesting points. As a, as a collector now, what, how, what is the process for you to discover art and artists and is it through spaces? Is it through Twitter post or is it through marketplaces? Well, there's a couple of things. Obviously I see a lot of things in the Twitter feed and you just react to it. You say, wow, this is great. And then you look more into it. You might, you might buy it. That's, that's really, that's really easy. Um, I'm starting to discount things that come in in direct mail because why should why should people get a, a boost up just because they, they reach out? I, I love people coming into my direct messages to have a conversation. I don't want people coming into direct messages just to shill their stuff. You know, ta tag me if you think it's something that I'll particularly like. Tag me on your Twitter post. I always check my notifications. I'll scan through it and I'll, I'll go buy it if it's not something I like. Um, but people, a lot of people don't do the homework. You know, people do come, come and offer me nudes and frogs and stuff that I'm never going to buy. You know, look at my, look at my collection. Have I got any of this stuff in there? No, you just need to look at my foundation homepage and see the, my new wallet foundation homepage. You see the sort of stuff I like. It's, a very traditional aesthetic. It's, you know, it's beautiful. It's not daubs. It's not, you know, it's not abstract. I'm getting into a little bit more, but selectively, it's not, um, you know, not, not a big fan of e X copy and, and sort of glitch art. I'm not a big fan of collage, but the 3d animations, the traditional dig digital art, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of brands, a lot of genres that I really go for. So how you how do you get my attention? I'm a creator. People get my attention by buying my work, if I'm honest. You know, if someone's bought my work and I don't know the name, I'll go and I'll check them out and I might like their stuff and buy it. That's not a strict tit for tat. You know, there's no guarantee that because you buy from me and you're an artist, I'm going to buy. But at least it gets my attention in a very effective way. Um, people, I, I think the other place is... Well, what people underestimate is how much collectors enjoy the hunt. They like to find stuff. It's like the difference I, I always say between if you walk walk through Chinatown and you're getting menus stuck in your face all the time, are you going to go into one of those restaurants? Probably not. After a while, you're just going to say, no, you're, you're going to go to the one that you've read about, that all your friends are talking about. You want to go and find the great restaurant. And then you've got, then you feel a sense of achievement. I think in the same way, collectors like to go and find the new artists. What, what I used to do on my old account, why I got up to 385 artists that I'd supported on foundation was I used to actually go to the bargain basement. I used to look at the people who are listing at 0 0.01. And I would literally, when I had a few, you know, $100 or, you know, a few pips of ether in my wallet, I would say, okay, I'm in a buying mood and I'd go through. I would never get past 0 0.01. I would certainly never get past 0 0.02 before I found some art that I really liked. And I, there were some, some of those people I'll go back to again and again um, because I just like the art. Some of them, it's not that they don't understand the market pricing. It's not that they don't, uh, don't want to eventually make lots of money from their art. Some of them just want the art to be accessible to as many collectors as possible. I call them those my pocket money heroes. And I had a nifty gateway drop where I just took four or five of them and just put them and said, look, here's a, another collector base. We're going to do this $5. We're going to do $5 pieces. And that was a great. It was a really successful drop. And they got lots of people saying, hey, this guy's great. How come I've never seen him before? It's because most people, most collectors, aren't looking at the 0 0.01, you know, bargain basement of, of foundation. I found so much great stuff there. So I like the hunt and the chase. I like to go. But as I say, I, that, that effort on the ETH chain is going to be restricted for a, in the next couple of months.
I like the way you call them pocket uh, heroes. Pocket money heroes. Pocket yeah. money heroes. Uh, they are, they are, they are because I really. Now, I, I tell you what. What I did at first, I thought, "Oh, this is a mistake. He's undervalued." So I'd buy them for point zero one, and I'd multiplied five or ten times. I'd put it back for sale at point one, thinking, "Let's raise this guy's floor." And what did they do? They came in with new work at point zero one again. I said, "What? What's going on? Do you not know?" We don't want to raise the floor. We want as many. We never want money to be a, a barrier to people collecting our art. We want to do now that that actually caused a big big switch in my brain. It caused, it caused a big a big switch in my brain, which eventually was responsible for me putting out my monkeys at ten dollars and selling over four thousand dollars of them. So the, the, I've got a. Yeah, I owe them a big debt of gratitude because they made me rethink because everyone everyone has this there's a couple of big myths in in the nft space one is this whole narrative of diamond hands get rewarded you buy it you maintain the floor at all all odds you don't go below the floor you maintain it and you know gradually over time it's going to go up. no one yeah no one's paying but no one's paying a million dollars for a beeple anymore. They, yeah, maybe maybe one of ones. But you know, I saw beeples changing hands for nine thousand uh, dollars a little bit. The the people are realizing, uh, and the the global economy doesn't help this. The fact that people who were very crypto wealthy aren't feeling so wealthy anymore mm. now that ether ether is a quarter of what it was and bitcoins down the same same amount suddenly they aren't very wealthy they're keeping their hands in their pockets and not spending so much and i'm sure that some of them are being asked by their partners what do you mean you spend a hundred thousand dollars on a bunch of pixels you know we've got bills to pay you know we're not really multi-millionaires how can you how can you be happy to have a board ape as a pfb when you know when we're scratching together to pay the mortgage so there's a there's there's a real there are economic reasons why there's a bear, a bear market the, the, even the bear market is, is having a bear market at the moment <laughs> but, but nft is gr still a great vehicle for distribution of art and i think the renaissance will come people are going to have bags that are never going to be worth what they paid for them that's just a fact it's true of me it's true of lots of other people you've got to kind of Put that behind you and move on. The renaissance is coming from these one, two, three dollar, ten dollar drops, and we'll build up again from that base because now people have got a very low cost base, and the best art will will shine through and start to to grow in value. Wow, very interesting. So we asked, we got to know how you got into NFTs. Now looking at these bear market and circumstances and all all the hacks you have been through and so much that has happened uh times have changed what sells and doesn't sell has uh sales has changed what still keeps you here uh i think it's i i, I love the curation role i love the fact that you know i in the curation role i'm not trying to persuade collectors to buy my stuff um and um I, i'm not having to raise funds to buy stuff that i like instead i can i can introduce great artists to a very broad range of collectors and just act as the middleman and you know hopefully make a little bit uh, uh you know be a broker and make a little bit of a brokerage commission on that i think it's it's the great third phase of the career I'll keep the creation going. I'll keep the collection going. But curation is really where I want to be. I was very disappointed I didn't get the chance to be a curator of spaces on Super Rare. Because I've, there's some people that I've collected when they were on Tez. I've encouraged them to go on to OpenSea and Foundation. I've represented them on Nifty Gateway. You know, the next step, some of them are really ready for the step up to Super Rare, one of one. You know, getting getting under the gaze of the real whales and getting that kind of attention, that would be. Then I would be able to offer people a complete 
career path as artists from you know selling things for one tez to selling things with a minimum bid of one ether on uh, on super rare that i, I hope will come uh, along the line some sometime but in the meantime i'm very happy to do mass market sales of the artists that i like to the nifty gateway collectors it's a, such an interesting time that we have come back in a full circle uh, we said that um gallerists don't have a lot of role to play and there's no middleman and we can sell directly in nfts like a year or two back would we say but their their place is also important in the whole art business that we can see now with curation happening even with nfts and even with uh, the web3 so doing being a curator full time and seeing what is what sells what doesn't sells having those contacts of collectors and seeing just as providing value to collectors by picking up very good gems of artists and uh, and the, for the artists as well connecting them with collectors that they wouldn't have got a time to engage with so it it works out for everybody that's a very interesting uh, step yeah it is and and i would have said that web3 was all about disintermediation i'm a real big fan of what manifold is doing because they they're doing end to end self service you know you create your contract you mint it you market it you put it in a gallery you have a claim page you can do it all end to end and what are we finding some of those claim pages are just not selling out because the people uh, you know people the why would the collector come to you if if the collector isn't following you already on twitter how are they going to know where you are how are they going to ever find that claim page there is a there is a role for platforms platforms aggregate artists and collectors you know the uh, these people uh, who are going on nifty gateway they get an access to the nifty gateway collectors who aren't necessarily on twitter some of them aren't even in the nifty gateway discord but they are on the platform and they're watching all all of the drops so yeah there's more of a role of of middleman in web3 than you might have thought because i've done manifold pages with collections that i thought were quite reasonable and you know they've sold half a dozen they've sold next to nothing um and it's because despite having 17000 followers on twitter not all of them are going to go off and and buy something from a, a manifold link so um end to end self service and disintermediation that's the dream um but how are people going to find you how they find you is either through having a very strong twitter or instagram following or it's going to be a place that people congregate naturally which is the platforms very interesting you can say you can tell i'm spending 24 hours a day thinking about nfts and i'm you know eating and breathing them so this as you mentioned crypto wealthy people coming in they are the ones who started pushing the nfts market further and getting it out in the news uh for me i was following crypto uh, since 2016 2017 but never really thought to come in it because there was just speculation no real uh, utility or uh, what's the point sort of but when nfts came along there was like oh now i can display my artwork around the world i can earn from it people can buy it doesn't have to be for limited period of time in a particular wall of a particular gallery in a particular city everyone 24/7 is having a look at it so these are points for uh, us as an artist who who were non crypto native who onboarded into crypto because of nfts how would you spark an interest of a non crypto native for collecting nfts uh i think i think you'd have to have a real seamless experience i mean even after collecting on nifty gateway for 6 months going to metamask and signing transactions and waiting till gas fees were low that was like a, a, an alien language that's not something the man in the street is going to do i think the man in the street is yeah can deal with e-commerce they used to putting in google pay or their credit card and and getting something now 
they aren't going to want to custody the things. So they weren't going to want a custodied wallet that they can go and look at when they like. They've got assurance that it's secure, but they weren't going to want ease of viewing the thing probably on their on their phone because everyone's living through their phone at the moment. You've got to be able to see it, buy it, store it, um, and transfer it all from the phone seamlessly and securely. That's the that's the challenge. That's the infrastructure that will gain mass acceptance. How much time would it take? I don't know. I think you know, Samsung is and Android are looking into uh, custody. All of the um, a lot of the socials are looking at um, enabling wallets for NFTs. Uh, I don't think it'll be more than a, a year or so before you can have a better experience. I don't much like browsing NFTs on on mobile, but I'm I'm in a minority. I always I always prepare my drops so that they look good on the laptop, and I forget that people are actually scrolling through on the mobile phones. I have stopped using mobile phone. I don't even have an OpenSea or MetaMask in it. It's all through uh, a browser or I yeah. mean, a PC. It's so convenient to have uh, the big scale of art and see. It's easy to, it's even more easy to manage like that. Yeah. All right. So how um, this market situation, how do you think it's going to unfold in how many years? Globally, it's an issue, right? So yeah, I, I, how the, would that affect yeah. NFTs? I, I, I think... Uh, there, there was a bubble. People were right about the, the tulip mania. There was a bubble. And what it was was real crypto wealthy people um, finding some, something to do with their, their money. You know, and that, you know, uh, and there was there was a lot of um, uh, a lot of competitive bidding and a lot of yeah, a, a, really a lot of people just showing off their wealth via NFTs. And that led to real price price inflation. Price inflation, so that other people were just priced out, and that's uh, that's to me that's the that's the meaning of a lot of board ape PFPs. It's hey, I can afford one of these. Can you? You know, you're you're in a pretty elite club if you've got a a, a bucket full of punks, original punks, or or board apes. Now that's fine. It's how people get the validation. There's a lot of different reasons for buying NFTs. I never believe this blanket assertion, oh, it's all about the art. No, sometimes it's it's status. It's saying I'm in this club. Sometimes it's financial. You buy the thing that you think you're going to flip for 10 times as much a week later. Uh, sometimes in a minority, sometimes it's just support. Sometimes it's just this guy needs a break. And especially at the law end, I've been I've been guilty of that a lot. Just saying, you know, let's chuck this guy a bone. He's been, it's been sitting there for six months. It's acceptable art, but you know, no one's buying. Let's uh, let's give them some support. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why there's a lot of different pe reasons why people make art, and there's a lot of different reasons why people collect. Um, so how are they going to change going forward? The only one that's going to go away, I, I guess the status you know showing showing your wealth is kind of less socially acceptable than it was um and also your wealth has probably come down significantly from when you were doing that so you know a lot of big whales are, are sort of gone have gone absent there's a lot of accounts have just sold up and disappeared because it wasn't a perpetually up cycle of course mm -hmm. it wasn't so all of a sudden they're left with this supposed valuable inventory that they can't actually realize any of that money. Um, the people who are in trouble are the people who took these apes and things as collateral for real money loans. You know, now they're sitting, they might ask for their money back or ask for additional collateral. And the guys can say, tough, you've got my ape, keep it with my blessing. Um, I, I don't know why I'm I don't know why I'm singling out apes. They are the ones that have kind of maintained their price best. But you, you take my meaning. Some of the big yeah. projects aren't looking like such a good investment anymore. So over time, I said there's lots of different reasons for collection. Just pure, what do I do with all this money is going to go away because there's less of that disposable wealth about. 
um, there's going to be less flagging status. There's going to be just as many people s saying, um, I might be able to flip this, maybe not just as many, in a down market, in a bear market, that's not nailed on. Nobody is, nobody is buying out every 10K PFP um, the way they used to. People are still developing the PFP projects. I, I don't, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a risky business right now. Um, mm. What's what's going to happen in one of one? One of one might have might maintain its position at the top end. People who really value scarcity and art and quality of the the artist, super rare, I, I think, is opening the gates a little bit. It's not going to change significantly. Foundation is already the bringing in drops. They've got artists at point zero one. They are effectively open sea. They, they won't like me saying it, but they are. OpenSea is going to keep keep on doing OpenSea. Um, you know, the, I can't I can't understand why they don't do better. There are things that I put out in December twenty one, like whole projects of two hundred pieces in collaboration with No Eels, which almost immediately got copy minted on the Poly oh, no. on, on the Poly platform. They've known about it for years. They've never done anything to take it down, um, and I'm not promoting that thing because it's in a hacked wallet. So, uh, you know, but, you know, OpenSea is just uh, open sewer, really. Um, so, what the uh, so what else What else is going to go on? I really like the, the, this pile them high, sell them cheap. I like the fact, I like, you know, I mean, Nifty Gateway has always said, let's get to a billion people collecting NFTs. Well, a billion people aren't going to be spending multiple thousand dollars a million people spending 10 to 50 dollars i can believe so everyone wanted mass market i think this is what it looks like it looks like you know maybe not the one dollar the one dollar is kind of played out a little bit it's overpopulated on if you get but maybe this mid-range 50 to 100 dollars that could uh, that could see some growth and adoption because people can spend that kind of thing. People will spend that on a meal. Why not spend it on on art? I asked the other day on the on the Twitter feed, why is it that two D stills sell better than animations? To me, so much more work goes into three D animations, but people still prefer to on a like for like basis. Two D stills sell better. People sell well. People recognize it as as art. You know, people think of it as something they can print out and stick on their wall. And I think there still is that old-fashioned notice uh, notion of this is what art is. So, you know, 2D, uh, 2D stills in the... Uh, you'd pay $50 for a decent print. Why not pay it for an NFT uh, that you can display on your TV or mm. print out and stick on your wall? I have one question and then we'll uh, talk about Metaverse. So you talked about um, those artists who are really, really good, like Jason from uh, the um, Vision of Chaos and other people. People who are there in NFTs, it's a whole new range of artists who wasn't... I mean, many of them might have just become artists because through NFTs. Yeah. So when do you think or what do you think those... People who have been doing it for many, many years, or will they will their approach change towards NFT, or their era will end because of people who are rising through NFTs? Uh, well, the, I mean, it's not going to end. It's going to be additive. It's going to be people getting into NFTs who weren't artists before. It's going to be some artists saying, "I want nothing to do with NFTs," and they'll have their you know the gal their galleries, their collectors. They'll have books. You know, print. I've got a one of the few art books I've ever bought was a beautiful um, uh, electric state, I think, from Simon Stallenhag. They'll have their their outlets, their Instagram and, and their, their websites. Um, and there'll be some traditional artists who dip a toe in the water. You know, I've got, a, I did a trad art week, a tradigital week, where it was all people with traditional art skills who were just like, and some of those, some of those guys have become very popular. You know, some like Chauvet and Collins Doodles have become very popular in the Nifty Gateway community and they're seeing the possibilities of getting to a wider audience and making some money while they do it by doing NFTs. So I think there'll be everything. Now, I said 
There's lots of different reasons for people collecting. There's lots of different reasons for people creating as well. Some people, as you say, they've been doing art. They're, you know, dyed, uh, dyed in the wool artists. They're going to do art whether they can get this NFT distribution channel or not. It's just another another little way that they can get their art out there. Some people are jumping on the bandwagon and saying this is a way to make money. Now, some people, you know, that's kind of cynical. They're, they're saying, oh, PFP, we'll do, do a PFP. We'll, we'll, we'll copy doodles or board apes and we'll get something out there. And it's all about all about the money. And there are quite a lot of artists for whom who actually need the money. You know, there's a lot of artists I've, I've come across who actually it's their, you know, it's their main bed and bread and butter. The, the, there are people who say, you know, who wouldn't, artists who wouldn't think of accepting 0.1 of an ether for an artwork. And there are others for whom a 0.1 ETH sale will pay their bills for the month. Um, and, and the great thing about Web3 is it's global. You know, you don't know where people are or who they are. Um, and it's given opportunities to so many people in who otherwise would be really economically disadvantaged. First couple of years on the collector side and the artist side of NFT really favoured, and I'm not going to get get all, all socialist on you, but it really favoured um, the northern hemisphere and the western countries. So it's all it's all US dollar based. It's all you know big. Uh, ether bros who had money and it's principally you know white artists who are making a living from their art now um what's happened is uh, anyone can now create nft art i've i've had art submitted to me it wasn't very good art but it was you know 16 year old indian boys doing some you know photo, uh, photo bashing on a mobile phone and then sending it to me you know i didn't buy it but so I didn't buy many of them, but some people might. It might be exactly what someone wants. Now you've got a, a chance, you know, for the youngest person in the family to make more than the, the rest of the family combined. Um, and that, that's very exciting, um, except for those uh, original artists and, and collectors, the people, who, the people who benefited from the narrow scope of the first year or so. Uh, now we, we've almost outsourced the art globally. And some of the OGs that I'm, I've brought in, real pioneers in 3D animation. But now I know lots of people in developing countries who are absolute experts in Blender. They can make Blender jump through hoops. They've got, you know, flying cars going through cyberscape streets and they're doing this over and over again. Great art, you know, uh, the equal of anything I'm seeing from anyone else. And um, and their, uh, their minimum acceptable purchase price is way below what the other guys need to live. So all of a sudden, they, this is another thing. This has nothing to do with the economics of the world, the, the, the um, bear market in ether. And this is really just the outsourcing of talent, just like we've outsourced call centers to other parts of the world and manufacturing. Now we're, now we're outsourcing art and people, if they stick in, there are free tools like Blender where they can develop skills that have a real market value. Now, I find all that very exciting. I'm very happy to represent and, you know, to introduce those artists to a bigger audience, but there are, you know, it's not a zero sum game. There are people who are going to be disadvantaged by this universal access. The parameters you mentioned for being an artist, I fall into a couple of those as well. Uh, NFTs is, I mean, I've been doing NFT full time for more than a year now. And NFTs is my main source of income. I've, I've dived into it completely. A podcast is there, but I, I'm still reaching an audience where I can start accepting people uh, for uh, whatever promotion or sponsorship that's also open uh, for the viewers uh, and i'm from india so another thing <laughs> yeah. this has opened up and art was never looked like this before nfts 
either in my community or people around me it was just a thing for hobby or something that you're good at but it's not a valuable skill but with yeah. nfts you can actually uh, flourish it or um, keep developing it and share it with the world and yeah. you will definitely find a tribe or people interested in that kind of work yeah yeah i mean you you're probably aware the other artists that i'm in, in touch with i'm really excited by what what they're all doing and i'm not meaning to be patronizing but i've got to recognize that you know i th- there are some people i've been all, almost apologetic not not india but some other developing countries i've been almost apologetic because from my perspective their drop hasn't gone very well and i'm only sending them you know 150 200 then they come back and say this is more than i've ever earned from my art before in in my life so thank you so you've got to you've got to recognize this there's there are real imbalances economic in, imbalances me in the uk you know it's been going as well as i could hope on the nft side it's still a long long way from being my main hustle i still have to do my consulting and uh, send out invoices every month to keep a roof over their head and it'd be a long time before nfts fill that space but i do recognize that for some people it's you know it, it's where their next meal is coming from i also host uh, weekly spaces we have done 40 um, since this is the 47th week the space goes on for 12 hours on saturdays we get 12 hours from... wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i find so, I, i've done very few spaces i like a face to face interview um i've done very few spaces because i find them very very difficult to you know very difficult technically because I'm an android user so I have to fire up an old iphone um but I've got to do a few I'm doing one this afternoon about ai um with our I'm an android user too by the way it was a lot of issue but then after elon musk came in having an android app became a, became an advantage <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because <laughs> apple users are having problem but uh, the the what i was saying was spaces has been a great way for me to connect with people and see artists and see collectors and see what what is going on uh, in the nft space so uh, 12 it's 12 hours because to give an opportunity for everybody to speak it's been more than 10 months and still the like we have to we have to request people to come again so there are so many people who come in and i feel happy that everyone gets a chance to speak new artist uh, who have never spoken before or seen before get a chance to present and collectors also get to see them uh, when they're listening in the audience what i've observed in recent times is i mostly see people from these three zones it's either iran uh, russia ukraine or nigeria i mean yeah it's yeah uh, not so many from us hardly any from india so this and what do you see the common thing between them is i don't know about nigeria but both the other countries have been have sanctions by us yeah well, the world. yeah so, they, they they all can't do open sea they can't um and they they need to get their message out somehow um it's funny those three those three places are places that i've represented artists from i i guess turkey is the other one turkey is more more mainstream turkey has got some some great publishers um now on nifty gateway you so they're having a renaissance and they're getting a lot of i see a lot of turkish art getting out there but i often don't know you know i often don't i often collect from people and it's only some somewhere down the line i find oh we're from iran or from from russia or ukraine or, or whatever um nigeria i did a whole i did a whole week focusing on pencil art on kind of oh. it was called back to basics it was pencil pencil art charcoal biro and just by coincidence i found that all of my artists were from nigeria um it was it just you know just by choosing that kind of basic art style i i'd kind of isolated them um I guess there are a lot of similarities in the in the area they come from so like nigeria you mentioned pencil hyper realistic works and the russia ukraine region comes with uh, purple works with lot of illustrations and women in them and yes yeah uh, some popping and, and, things like that 
And the, the cyberscapes, I'm getting more cyberscapes from India than anything else. You know, the, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these great futuristic city views, um, people seem to be really, I don't know, sharing skills and helping each other up the ladder uh, in India, Kashmir. Absolutely. So uh, what what I think is NFT is giving such people a chance to earn as well, right? Having sanctions from the world, they are so secluded that this becomes a good opportunity to for them to show their work without any restrictions or any from anybody. So mm -hmm. they are optimizing on the uh, opportunity here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I do you know what it, it's true. You run the you run the risk as a publisher or introducing these. You run the risk. You've got to pay your artists somehow. So I've, I've kind of run the risk of potentially sanctions busting because I've got to pay my artists and the artist is sitting in, in Russia or, or um, Iran or, or some, you know, somewhere with, that's got, got limitations. I've got to be a little bit careful because I got one wallet that was tagged as suspicious and I'm pretty sure it was because of funds that I was sending to artists in, in Iran. Oh. Um, so, so yeah, you've got to be a little bit careful. Now that tainted wallet has also been hacked, so it's my hacker's problem now. <laughs> All right, Mark, what are your views on metaverse? I, it's a, I, I'm I'm keen on it in 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 concept. I'm not enthused by the state of it at the moment. It's still, I mean, I have maybe because I've never been a gamer. You know, I've never. Uh, mentally inhabited these 3D spaces and moved about in them and, you know, shot rifles and things like that. I think Metaverse is great for gamers because you'll get up and running and you'll you'll get familiar with it very quickly. I have real problems navigating in 3D from a keyboard. Uh, so even the online galleries that people do, I find I'm getting stuck in a corner and I have to back out and go back in again. So I'm not I'm not rushing to join the Metaverse. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got a couple of metaverse assets, like bits of land that were given to me. And I'm not really, I'm not set up to capitalize on it. My level of tech sophistication goes as far as seeing a, a list of NFTs, you know, watching an, an animation on a laptop screen. I'm not, I've, I've got a headset. I've got a 3D headset. It gives me, it gives me a headache. Um, you know. But I'm, I'm not likely to be joining the rush to the metaverse. I think it's going to be the next big thing. Mm. You know, I think there's so much money being invested in it. Um, people are going to, going to go there. But um, that's probably where I'll bow out. I'll, um, uh, my level of tech sophistication won't stretch into... You never know. It has um, uh, people, people who are with so many years of experience like you, even coming in uh, NFTs is a uh, challenge, right? technological challenge per yeah. se, if you say so you never know six months down you are the biggest collectors of metaverse yeah. objects or uh, installations yeah if i if i'm ever lying in my sick bed i might ask to get the get the head headset strapped on just so i can expand my horizons a bit <laughs> all right what what does art do for society or the world um Oh no! You kept the the toughest question to last. Uh, I don't know. I think art art at its best is uh, it's kind of philosophical. It's really more metaphysical. Art is a, a medium of communication, and um, one of the things that's leveled about AI is it's just mechan mechanical. It's just you know. It's just bits and bytes arranged in a, a pleasing pattern. It's not really communicating anything from from one soul to another. So even if someone looks at it and says, "Oh, I really, uh, this really makes me feel something. I I like it." It's not really art. Um, but I, I I take the view that all AI art is generated. Now this is generated from databases of pictures, of photos, of billions of, of billions of things. Every one of those photos or pictures or artworks captures a unique moment in time. Like, like it's a complete, it's a unique human experience that's going into the database and then it's getting mushed up 
Um, but then that's the components that are getting represented. So it's not it's not coming out of the ether. It's not random bits and bytes. What it is is it's a sort of melange. It's a mixture. It's like soul soup. It's a it's a mixture of everything. It's almost like the collective unconscious of every artist or photographer whose work is represented in that database. So I think we're com with, even with AI, we're communicating more than we know when we when we generate something. We put in a prompt uh, uh, that says, you know, a beautiful picture of a sunset or something like that. Well, there have been beautiful pictures of sunsets throughout history that have, and those pictures have been captured with feeling by photographers, by artists. It's all been put into the soup and it's presenting something. Now, why can't you see that as representing the hopes and dreams and feelings of everyone who's contributed to that, to those moments of human experience? I think we uh, it can communicate something quite profound. I put in something, you know, there's something that, the sum of the art that I've created, um, that really makes me makes me feel something, and I'm thinking this isn't just random bits and bytes. This is, you know, the, I think the the prompt was to do with um, with a, the a line from a poem. I love to use poetry as prompts, so it was, you know, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And there was a, a beautiful kind of monochrome thing with angel wings and so on in the middle. That I thought, yeah, that's exactly the feeling that I wanted to convey, and it's been picked up by this AI database, and it's represented. So I minted that and and sold it. So what is what is art? I think art at its best is communication between souls, or it's 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 a bit like your know, great great literature. Great literature shows you what it shows you. You recognize yourself in the feelings and the words expressed, and the purpose of that is to show that we're all the same. What you recognize is actually, that's the sort of feeling I have. And when art shows you something, you say, yeah, that's the sort of feeling I have. So art is communication between souls to the end of showing that actually we're all one and the same. That's wow. probably, not, probably not what you were looking for, but uh, that's genuinely how I feel about it. I'm looking for everything. This is such a subjective question that all the different ideas on this topic are welcome. In fact, I'm going to be doing a compilation of everybody's answer on this and making mm -hmm. it a different video. Yeah. You talked about putting, uh, putting poetry into uh, AI and getting a visual. Let yeah. me tell you, I'm not very good at poems. So I, I wrote a pro prose, I wrote a paragraph mm -hmm. in chat GPT and asked it to make a poem for me. <laughs> oh, really? How did that turn out? It was very good. Yeah. <laughs> with some <laughs> with some tweaks, I was able to make it better. Yeah, but that that was such a good experience. Now I can put instead of putting a paragraphs in the description of the artwork, I can actually put a poem <laughs> yeah. in the description to describe the works. Yeah. Okay. So Mark, time for some rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. Name three people, living or dead, that you would like to have lunch with, and why? Living or dead. I mean, there's there's a there's a collector and artist who I really like his uh, his his style. You probably haven't come across him. D. P. Oxley, Luna Bunnies. I just like his approach to. NFTs to life to, you know, I think he's got great balance. I'd love to love to uh, kick back and uh, and have time with him. Um, I think I think Luis Duo Crypto, uh, you know, this is just in the NFT space. Duo Crypto is a, a great guy, great collector, great artist, great great friend. You know, I'd, uh, I'd I'd like to spend time with him, and of course. Who wouldn't like to sit down and chat with uh, with Mike Winkleman with people? Because he's he's a family man. He's just a regular guy who caught this wave and rode it. And he's still one of my favourites of the big guys. He's probably the one I like best because he's got in, he's still constantly innovating. He's been working solidly. You know, it wasn't an overnight success. He'd been working on his daily 
uh, daily artwork for years before he got his break and he's still doing it and he's still kept a kind of seemingly a balanced approach love to sit down and shoot the breeze with uh, with mike winkleman what is your favorite book i my favorite book is actually it's it's kind of a, a metaphysical tome and you people might not have heard of it for ages but it's called a course in miracles and it's it's like it's like spiritual guidance it's it's my favorite sort of second favorite would probably be uh, would probably be Damon Runyon short stories but I, I, I like a, I like a lot of literature what is your favorite movie I, I'd probably go with you know there's a there's kind of a top 10 but uh, pulp fiction has probably got it all you know that's the one that's the one that's got more more scenes that you remember and keep going back to in your mind I has got more of those than anything else i've seen what advice would you like to give your younger self uh, you know, don't give up the the creative side you know the, the at various times i've wanted to be a musician you know i'm a banjo player guitar player songwriter novelist i've written a couple of novels um yeah i would just say keep, keep on focusing on on the creative side you don't know where it'll lead um i think i think the advice that i i would give is the advice that any old person would give to their younger self which is take corporate life take employment less seriously it's not you know all, all of these companies i spent 40 years in almost in in corporations they'll always demand upward loyalty but then there's no downward loyalty when it's convenient they'll get rid of you it's a it's a transaction see it as a transaction and uh, frame it to, to help yourself so i would say spend spend more time with the kids spend less time on 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 the in the office you know all the usual stuff that uh you know, all those deathbed regrets you hear about it's all true what about the money question then which bunny question money uh, mm-hmm. I, when you're young money is one of the questions right yeah so what what would you advise yourself about money when you're younger yeah i don't know i don't know just uh, just keep a balance i i've never had a problem on the income side it's always been on the spend side so just just keep a keep a balance don't uh, don't overextend um but it's it's interesting though money is uh, mon- this is something i would say to nft artists money isn't the aim money is not the aim um you you can yes money's useful to get to get over you pay for your necessities and get to a comfortable life but money is better seen as as the medium it's a, it's called currency for a, a reason it's meant to flow and the people who uh, the people who use money sensibly recognize that it's a tool for the transfer of energy it's it's kind of loving energy goes where money goes um and it's a misuse of money to just stick it in a box um and 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 keep it and hoard it and get it all, all to yourself the real purpose of money is to keep on moving and keep on enabling people as it goes mm-hmm. it's a bit like uh, if you think of ethereum i think of ethereum if if i buy if i buy something from you and give you anything you can stick it in a wallet and go away forget about it or you could uh, you could buy something you know a slightly lower price because of gas from someone else who you really like or and they could buy go and buy a pfp or something and do something else that same bit of ethereum you know with diminishing because of gas is just going around now now five people have got a sale four people have been collectors isn't that so much more useful than the ether just coming to you and it goes in a box that the same analysis for ethereum works for money in general um you you've got to have a it takes a long time to get get to a, a sensible appreciation of what money is for beautiful you mentioned you are a musician and you write books but it was very difficult for me to find links to where we can see that so 
Could you please share it with the, us? I would yeah, add to the yeah, sure. description. Yeah, yeah. A, I mean, everything's linked from medium.com. I've got a, I've got a, a, a source book. Um, I, and medium.com, I think is the, the title is source book. I've got a, uh, still got a, I very seldom go there now because I've moved from writing to creating. Should we both. create a link tree for you? Do you know what? My link tree got hacked. I don't know why. How does the link tree get hacked? I don't know. No idea. <laughs> uh, but the link tree got hacked and I didn't realize till someone said, is this the right thing? I went and it was awful because the link tree had an extra thing, which was biography, short biography. And it was a downloadable file. And I, I thought, where did this come from? I tried downloading it and the virus detector said, this has got a virus in it. Oh my so, God. So I deleted the link tree. And until I know how to build one securely, I'd better not, better not uh, put it out there. Whoa, that's something new I need to alert people about. Yeah, yeah it was scary. Um, I, I, you know, they find all ways to try and catch you out. So yeah, so medium.com, I mean, it's actually on Amazon Kindle. Uh, it's Mark M. Kelly, Alpha Lab Obsession, um, but it's available for free from my Medium page. So anyone who wants to, I'd recommend the Alpha Lab, not so much Obsession. The Alpha Lab is uh, is a bundling together of all of these new age ideas, a bit of Mae West, a bit of Damon Runyon, uh, a lot of me in there. So with the same name, uh, Sourcebook, or is it with Mark Kelly? Uh, in uh, the medium.com, I'll tell you, just one second. I think it's, it's okay. Not... Just send send the link to me. I'll, I'll put it in. It'll be easier I'll for people to. I'll do yeah. that. Um, what is the most priceless gift you have ever received? Oh, I know. We received every day, you know, life and breath and having another day to, to greet the world. I, I, I mean, when you say gift, I always think of the gifts that have a lot of meaning behind them. So, you know, a, a couple of people have given me very nice musical instruments. My oldest son, who's like mid forties, gave me an instrument. I think it was for my 60th birthday that he'd had specially made. And now my, my wife is Cuban. Um, my, I've always liked the banjo. He may, he presented me a specially made instrument, which is a Cuban cigar box banjo. Um, and it was literally a Cuban cigar box, which had a neck put on it and and strings put on and a, tri yeah, a pickup. It's got a beautiful tone. Um, so Cuban cigar box banjo in terms of, of I, things that I would never give away. Um, that's, that's probably going to be. But he's a very good, he gives very good gifts. You know, I'd love to see that photo of that. Yeah. You, say, you said your wife is from Cuba and you also said that you had learned Spanish. So you yeah. talk with your wife in Spanish or in English? A mixture. <laughs> A, a curious mixture, you know, because she always talks to the children in, in Spanish. So this, it's Spanish in the house, uh, but, you know, Spanish and English between the two of us. Okay. Uh, what is on your bucket list next? Um, yeah, I, do you know what? I'd like to get back to, I, I mean, it's it's very modest, but I'd like to get back to, to travel. I'd like to go back to Malaga. I love Spain love Malaga. I'd love to be wandering along the promenade there instead of, you know, sitting in rainy UK. Yeah, I that was my first experience coming to NFT London in UK and the weather is so moody. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, I mean, I can just keep on talking about it. Uh, next question. What do you like to do for fun? Yeah, and this is fun. This is the this is my my relaxation. NFTs are my side hustle. If I don't have, you know, it's it's kind of a lot of work to put the drops together. When I've got, a, you know, once I've put those up on Monday and there's, I've got till the Sunday, I have to do a bit of real life work to pay the bills. If I'm kicking back, what I'll tend to do is, uh, is just experiment because I've got two big GPUs. I've got a, you know, uh, NVIDIA 3090, an A6000. They can do great things. I'm experimenting with video animation at the moment, trying to find the right way to, to get things spinning and looking three dimensional, just as if I were a blender expert, because once I crack that, 
it's going to be so much more um, so much more efficient than building stuff in Blender or Omniverse. Um, if you can create and manipulate 3D objects that are generated by AI, um, you could probably do overnight what would take weeks to do in uh, in Blender. If, yeah, in regular That's true. 3D things. That's true. Like we, there needs to be machine learning in for Blender. So like these are the objects I've created. This is my style. Okay, create something more new for me. Yeah. I'll I'm give sure you a fun fact. Using chat, Blender has this uh, function of, um, what do you say, Python scripting in it. So I'm not a very good at coding. Yeah. But I said, why not use chat GPT for it? I told chat GPT, I want this kind of objects. This, these are the things that I want. Write me a Python code for Blender. Wow. Did it work? Unfortunately, not uh, for the complex objects, but yeah, it created some cube and some basic things like that. But Excellent. there is, there is, <laughs> there is a scope oh, for that. You know, the, 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 it's really interesting. Chat GPT has made me realize that regular artists complaining about AI art is just the tip of the iceberg because all of a sudden with chat GPT, copywriters, um, journalists, lawyers, accountants, even coders, it seems, are all going to be redundant because people, the, the end user can just ask for what they want. Now, why, why can't you ask them? Uh, Python is interpreted language. It'll, uh, you know, you can say, now go through and debug that Python code so that it, so that it runs. Why not as a next step? Couldn't you say, create me an executable uh, you know, create me a binary executable program that does this, that, and the other. You know, it's the this really is disintermediation. Well, ChatGPT is the intermediary, but why pay you know thousands to programmers, thousands of dollars to programmers to come up with something that you can generate yourself? Why not have G ChatGPT generate the code and some other AI? check the code and turn it into an executable. So all of the, like, all of the, all of the, the knowledge industry is going to, this is why my TikTok feed is filled with people saying, Hey, here's some amazing AI stuff. All of the knowledge industries are going to go. So what's going to be left is, I don't know, creative industries, I suppose will survive in some form. Manual industries at the moment will survive until we get robots able to pick up trash and so on. Um, but uh, but yeah, the world of work is, is going to change dramatically. There's an amazing quote that I heard. This was again five years ago, that there is all sort of knowledge available on the internet. So getting knowledge or teaching somebody to remember things and holding information is not the skill that you need in this time. It is how to do like how to make use of those information and get it to use ah, another aspect that's it. that's, it. that's the the key skill is what question do you ask yeah. think, think it, i mean that's been this, the key skill in google for ages google is just a because you, you you make use of google by crafting a sensible query and then you get the the thing so knowing what to ask the ai to get the results that you want is going to be the key skill. Absolutely. One more thing for marketers or like for somebody to on the selling side is information is everywhere. Now people want curation. This is the, give me this information in this short amount of time directly what I want to know. And that is also now being replaced by chat GPT. It gives you all that. Yeah, actually, that's true. That is true. Um, the curation aspect, the, uh, you know, like, like, what are your top, top 10 records? People won't need fitness coaches, because you can say, look, I, I, I'm, I'm, I want a ketogenic diet that, does, that you know, doesn't leave me short of energy. I, I want some variety. Give me a menu. And it comes up with a menu. So you, you don't need your your nutritionist, you, know, you ask for what's, what are the exercises that are going to strengthen my core and it'll come up with your, your top 10 exercises and how many reps to do. The, the possibility, I mean, 
even Jordan Peterson's talking about it. The possibilities are limitless. Um, it's just what we ask it to do that's limited because we need to free our mind so we can make best use of this. So again, with AI, it only makes use of what all information is already there, like already been there and it works on the data, right? But so as you mentioned, creative things are still a skill that people would need, creating something that has never existed before. Yep. Or just stepping on top of AI and creating something that has never been before. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, all, it's all additive. We can, we're humans. We can add something into the mix. But yeah, the creative, maybe maybe artists are going to be the, the people least affected by AI. <laughs> Have you thought of that? <laughs> At the moment, they're the ones complaining, but you're right. They are the people who can pick up a brush and say, I'm going to make a mark here uh, that isn't predictable, that isn't, uh, that can't be replicated or, or uh, anticipated by, by AI. This is such a fun topic. We are, I'm, we are going to have a dedicated session on chat, chat GPT in uh, next, uh, next couple of weeks. I've been experimenting with so much and all those things you said, it works. Today, mm -hmm. I was trying to write a description. I made a video of uh, 2022 highlights. I wanted to write a description on that. So I gave it things. It, it made out a good uh, Twitter thread-like format. And then what I did was, okay, this is... I opened a new tab and I was like, I copied that. I made few changes, few words here and there. And then I put the same thing there. What other improvements can you do in this? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it improved on its own thing that it had said before. Yeah. Yeah. So like, as you said, code, like debugging a code, which is written by itself and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Definitely a possibility. And this is just like 15, 20 days or one month of uh, a chat GPT or how yeah. much can it learn and do in a year or two years? It's, um... Yeah, it's, it's interesting because obviously one of the inputs to its database is going to be all the questions that people are asking. It's going to say, this is the sort of stuff people are interested in. Let's, uh, let's refine this. Uh, it's uh, incredible technology. Amazing. What is, um, what are you curious about? Oh, um, I, I, I'm curious about people's motivations. You know, if someone comes up with a, I, with a sour comment in, in the public feed, you know, I don't like flame wars, but I, I'm thinking, where are they coming from? Where they, you know, would you did someone up, upset them? Um, where are they? Uh, some people get their validation from creating controversy. Mm -hmm. They want to be they want to be seen as the person who calls out the fakes and who is you know championing the uh, the underdog, and they they want. So, if you understand someone's motivation and and their inner drivers, then you kind of understand their actuations and you also can predict them to, to a certain extent. So I, I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in psychology. You know, what, what makes people tick and apply to the NFT space. It's, you know, what makes, why are artists doing what they're doing uh, and why are collectors acting in the way they are? And you know how to how to kind of negotiate through the the various things. How not to be how not how not to annoy people um, you know, by being because you know, sometimes you know, I can annoy people without without even wanting to. You know, put up something and they'll say, "Duh, that's obvious," or you know, "Stop patronising me." Um, uh, you, you've got to you've got to roll with the punches. I haven't had any haven't had any real bad arguments. On Twitter, I think NFT Twitter is a little bit of a kinder space yeah. than, than other regions, but but then you've always got the block button. You know, you, if someone gets if someone doesn't like what you're saying, there's a real easy way to stop them seeing what you're saying. You just block them and move on. Absolutely. What makes you tick? What makes me tick? I I don't know. I I'm I'm just like. A web, a web of you know, ambitions and obligations, and most of the time the obligations take priority. You know, I need to, I need to represent the artist well. I need to pay the artist. I need to, you know, get the get the drop done on time, so it's got a whole week to promote. Uh, but then I've also got my ambitions. I'm thinking, oh, 
I've created something nice. I'd like people to see it. I'd like people to buy it. Um, what makes me tick is the same as what every what makes every human tick. You got um, you, you, you got your mixture of of drivers and constraints. Um, you know, I've got. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I want to leave a legacy. I want to actually live a bit. I want to. I want to actually achieve something more than I've achieved so far. You know, another thing I love about you is the words and phrases you use. It's so unique. I've never heard that. Like I asked you about one of the collectors who's mysterious. So the way you described him, he's wrapped in something mystery and couple of more adjectives to that. I had to actually Google and find out what's the meaning of that. I was like, wow, this is so interesting. In the description of this podcast also, I'm going to highlight that fact that you'll hear a lot of idioms and nice ways to put out words and thought in yeah. sentences. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've been, I've been more of a writer than a visual artist so that that probably comes through and that Absolutely. that's probably, that's probably why the twitter feed is quite uh, is quite popular because you know i'm things come to me in in terms of phraseology uh, before they come to me in in terms of pictures yes uh, that's that's a what do you say strength for being a twitter user i guess <laughs> yeah. yes definitely uh, but- <laughs> Don't what, worry. Yeah, that, that, people... my, motto. my motto when when I was trying to flog literary NFTs, my motto was words have value too. And I think they do, but you just need to deploy them in the right place. Twitter is the right, right place to do big conversational tweets that get lots of engagement, lots of interest and lots of responses. I would say this another thing to the listeners. Don't worry if you're not very good at writing. You have chat GPT. <laughs> you, can, you can use that. So you're a writer. What are your favorite quotes that you have read or heard that they always stay with you? Favorite quotes? Well, you know, it's, it's some of those, uh, some of those kind of, some of the ones that I've used in the, um, I mean, some some quotes that I love are I, I like some from Course in Miracles. You know, uh, nothing, nothing that's real can be hurt. Nothing unreal exists. I've kind of you have to unpack everything that's in there. Um, you have to unpack and think about for a, a long time. But in the in the sort of pure poetry thing, things like uh, do not go gentle into that good night, rage against the dying of the light. As, an, as a, a senior citizen, and I'm within a week I'm going to get my state pension, I, you know, I, I like that idea of do something. Don't just, don't, don't just sit back and, and wither away. Do something new. Do something that, that keeps you the spark of, of interest alive. I like, that, I like that sort of thing. Good, good question. What quotes do I live by? Yeah. I, I like the, uh, you, the some of them. I like coming up with little epithets in the NFT space, and uh, there's some of them like uh, caution flees from desperation, uh, and and that's the, what that's expressing is don't shill too desperately. If you're if you're trying go, trying too hard, and you look like are you you you've, it's almost like when you're going for a bank loan, you got to look like you don't need it. You, you you can't you can't show them how desperately you need that money, or they're not going to give it to you. You got to say, yeah, I could use this for this and that. You you've got to kind of hide your real needs and and wants um, in order for people to be interested. Because if you're going after them and saying, please please buy from me, they'll run in the other direction. So caution flees from desperation. That's one of my own, and that, that's something that I think everyone every every artist who wants to get their their word out there should should remember, don't overdo it. You know, you can wear out your welcome very quickly. Wow, beautiful. Mark, what gets you excited about the future? I, I, do you know what? I, I try to, I try to live day by day. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to set things up for future success, but you know, so many times, there's so many things that didn't happen the way they 
uh, the way they, they should or the way they, you know, I had a, a 10K project which sold 200 pieces. I, I still like the art and I'm very grateful to the 200 or the 150 or so people who bought from it. But you can't, all you can do is um, th throw some, what's the thing, cast your bread on the waters. You cast your bread on the waters and you hope that it comes back after many days. That's the biblical quote. Um, you, you, you just got to keep putting stuff out there. Keep trying. That's the, the main thing. And you hope that something comes back. You hope that you get some. Now, it's you can spend weeks, months when you're just pushing stuff out there. You're helping other people. You're promoting your own work. You're creating new stuff. And nothing really comes back. And then all of a sudden, great example, Mirage Gallery. I put... 200, I actually created 250, 50 were set aside for uh, token holders, 200 pieces of AI art, some of the best stuff I've done, embracing chaos using this Rudali script. They kind of sold, but less than half of them sold uh, over, the, over the months. It was it kind of petered out. And all of a sudden, some big famous AI artist, Claire Silver, dropped on the same platform, Loads of people followed her in and said, what else is there? After her stuff was sold. So in an hour, 100 pieces sold at 0 0.08 each. It, it was just like, it was astonishing. Wow. And you can you can never anticipate or expect what uh, what good luck is going to come your way. So I'm, I'm very hopeful about the future, but I've got modest expectations. You know, nothing good happening would be fine. You know, it'd be bad if something bad happened. Nothing good happening is fine. If something good happens, it's a bonus. That's my uh, that's my approach to the future. Let's go. And with that exciting news or uh, for the future thought for the future, it's I think great time to conclude today's uh, episode. Thank you so much for joining and giving out your time and amazing insights to us. Uh, much love to you, Mark. All right. Thank you very much. Any parting words you want to say to our listeners or viewers? No, just uh, just be 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 human. You know, and the, the, that's the, the thing you've got to remember. The the artists are are humans. They've got human needs and wants and motivators. But artists, remember, the collectors aren't just bottomless wallets. They are people too. And and you've got to you've got to think about. What serves my collector's interests? What can I do for my existing collectors um, that makes them feel even better about the purchase they made? Remember the people behind the, the PFPs. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, wish you the best. All right. Thank you. Have a great week ahead. And All year right. ahead. New year. Happy New Year. You're yeah. the first. Uh, uh, guest for 2023 so Excellent. congratulations on that Excellent. I, w I wish you all good luck for for the rest of this year